Hello friends and good day to you, uh, wherever and whenever you're listening to this. I hope you're well. Um, you'll see that I'm at home recording this today. Uh, that's because our church, uh, the Sanctuary Prince of Peace, is having some asbestos abatement. And uh, we were worshiping in the fellowship hall today with different audio and all. So I thought I'd record this here uh, at my home after worship and send it out to you. I want to share with you a psalm for the day and then our gospel reading and the message will follow. This is a reading from Psalm 46. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked brings ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. And the gospel for today comes from Mark, the 12th chapter. As Jesus taught them, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour the widow's houses. And for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Then Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the temple treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples, and he said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them had contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends, thank you for listening to this message. I have to tell you that for all of the years that I've been a pastor in Christ Church, and even for many years before that, when I worshiped and did youth ministry, the story that we just heard has been used as an illustration of giving. The story about the widow and her tiny offering to her church has been used as an illustration for pledging of stewardship of our gifts to Christ's ministry. And that's the context that I've often, almost exclusively, heard this story applied to. The widow, lifted up by Jesus as a true giver, is lauded for her desire to hold nothing back from the needs of her faith community. She gave to the Lord's ministry all that she had to live on. Essentially, she gave her entire life to the Lord. Wow. Now, Jesus didn't say, after pointing out this widow's giving, go and do likewise. But over the years, I've certainly heard that implied or stated by pastors and by church leaders attempting 
to prompt joyful givers to the ministry of Christ here and now through the widow's example. And there's nothing wrong with that. The widow did, frankly, what most of us would never do. She dropped all that she had into the offering plate. Wow. I must confess to all of you today and to the Lord that I have never done that. I've never really seriously considered it. I've never sat down before worship on Sunday and looked at my balance in my checking account and written out that amount and put the whole thing in the offering plate. I've spent my entire life working in careers that are notoriously not profitable. Uh, prior to ministry, I was a newspaper reporter. And newspaper reporters in the 1990s didn't make much money. Newspaper reporters still don't if there are still jobs for them because many of the jobs at papers in our communities are no longer, uh, and they're no longer going. The papers have folded. And pastors in the church, Lutheran pastors anyway, notoriously work long hours, were essentially on call all the time, and they're paid a wage that they can live on, certainly, but we're not raking in the money for our career choice, for our callings. And frankly, we place other value on the work of ministry. Pastors need to live, but we don't need to live in luxury. And my point isn't to complain, but to admit to you that few pastors that I know in the Lutheran Church, and not me, have given up everything that we have for the church. We do give a lot, but not everything. And it's a challenge for most of us pastors and anybody to even tithe at 10% of our income to ministries that we care about. Jesus encountered an unnamed widow after previously encountering an unnamed rich man. The rich man, just a few verses ahead of this, asked about inheriting eternal life, and Jesus told him to sell all of his possessions and give the proceeds to the poor. And the rich man could not do that. So, Scripture says, he went away, for he had many things and much wealth. In the Gospel of Mark, very few people around Jesus know what to make of him. Throughout Mark's Gospel, the people around Jesus don't know how to do the things that Jesus asks of them, and they can't begin to know what Jesus is up to. They have a hard time even fathoming the meaning of Christ's very life with them. Jesus confounds the human world, as every heavenly being in Scripture has confounded the humans that they encounter. If you think back to stories of the Old Testament and even the New Testament, when angels of the Lord appear to people, those people are confounded. Fear not are usually the first words out of the angel's mouth, but fear and trembling often result in the encounter. The things that Jesus asks of his followers are fearful, and the people around Jesus don't really know what to make of them. It seems very different for Jesus to ask a rich man to sell all of his possessions than to tell a poor widow to give the church every last dime, to give every last ounce of her life and her sustenance to the temple. The two coins were all she had. And it seems different for Jesus to tell a rich man to sell out of his abundance than to tell a poor widow to give her last dime. Can you imagine Jesus urging the destitute to give whatever little they have 
to God. Have you read any Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament, that demands everything, everything from the needy, the poor? That's often what the popular interpretation of this widow's story proclaims. And I think that when we hear it that way, that Christ is lauding and even demanding everything from the poor widow, we may be missing a bigger point. We may miss a bigger point when we too lift up the widow for giving everything as an example of church support. A biblical scholar by the name of Sung Su Han wrote about Jesus and this implied demand that, that the poor widow give everything. He wrote this, the Jesus I know does not ask the destitute to squeeze themselves to the last drop to serve God. Rather, Jesus comforts and blesses the destitute. He condemns the rich and the powerful who exploit the poor. Can we say the same thing, Hong wonders, about Mark 12, the passage we just heard? Yes, he says, I believe so. Both the immediate context and the larger literary context support it. Friends, I agree. So let's look at the context of this widow's offering. In the verses just before we meet the widow, Jesus critiqued the scribes of the temple very harshly. Jesus even implied that they did not understand the scriptures, especially regarding the Messiah. That is part of why they not only fail to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, they're confounded by him and his presence with them, but they also oppose Jesus. Jesus critiqued the scribes' social and their religious practices. And the most relevant part is the verse that we heard just before the widow came on the scene in which Jesus said to the scribes that they devour widows' houses. They devour widows' houses. Jesus is not the first person in scripture to advocate for the care of widows, for the treatment of widows. Early in the prophetic witness, orphans and widows and strangers are lifted up. The prophet Ezekiel wrote this, Woe, you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, Ezekiel proclaimed, you clothe yourselves in the wool. Jesus offers a stinging critique to the shepherds of Israel in the temple of his day. A strong, stinging critique immediately after this critique is issued, the destitute widow, with only two small coins, comes to the scene. Wow! Jesus, as he shares this time in the temple, a very critical time for Jesus and critical of the temple practices. In the midst of this story comes the widow with two coins. If the leaders of the temple in Jesus' day had kept the law, especially parts of Deuteronomy, and really trusted God, then the widow in our passage today would not have become poor. If God's people, served by the church leaders Jesus is critical of, had been faithful to their callings and true to the law of Jesus, the words of the prophet, then this widow would not have become poor. The widow's extreme poverty is the evidence that the leaders have failed. What good is even the temple if it could not prevent this widow from destitute poverty? 
Jesus has already described the people of Israel as sheep without a shepherd. Those who were charged with being the shepherds, the leaders of the temple, have failed. Jesus is critical of them. So let's move the context out a little further. In the previous chapter of Mark, the 11th chapter, Jesus entered Jerusalem. He had been working his way with his disciples to Jerusalem, where he told them he would be killed and rise again. He finally made it to Jerusalem in chapter 11, and he even entered the temple. Mark tells us that he went in, looked around at everything, and then left. But the next day he returned to the temple again. And in the passages just before our reading today, Jesus throughout the money changers, the bankers who were doing business in their marketplace that was the temple of God. He, he overturned their tables in anger. In the verses immediately following the widow's offering that we hear today, Jesus declared the destruction of the temple. Chapters 11, 12, and 13 are a literary unit in Mark's gospel. And in this unit, Jesus makes a strong stand against the religious leaders and their practices that they made the focus of temple life. The unit of Mark points out their failures and announces their destruction. Jesus entered the temple and quoted from the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah preached a temple sermon himself, pointing out the failures of temple leaders of his day. Jeremiah wrote and prophesied, If you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, then I will dwell in this place with you, said the Lord through Jeremiah. So the last scene in the destitute widow at the temple for Jesus connects with the passage of Jesus to leaders at the temple through Jeremiah's similar message to the leaders on this day. And when Jesus cast out the money changers and the bankers from the temple, he quoted those words from the prophet Jeremiah. Caring for the poor, the immigrant, and the widow is hardly a new idea in prophetic literature. For instance, according to the prophet Amos, a major reason for the fall of the Northern Kingdom was the oppression of the poor. Scholar Sung Su Hong asked this question in response to the unit of the stories in Mark. Hong asked this, when does a temple of God hit rock bottom and lose its reason to even exist? Hong goes on to write this. Is it when merchants do business in the temple? Is it when the religious leaders challenge the authority of the Son of God in the temple? Is it when those leaders seek to trap the Messiah politically? Or is it when they misunderstand the scriptures? Is it when they say long prayers for the sake of appearance? Hong continued, quote, Jesus was sitting down at the court of the women in the temple, looking at the exceeding beauty and lofty columns there. And he turned his eye toward the temple treasury, knowing that the temple had already accumulated immense wealth. Jesus saw there many rich people offer large sums of money. Perhaps, Hong says, perhaps it was when the widow put in her last two coins that the temple hit rock bottom. Wow. In the next moment, 
the disciples of Jesus failed to understand. One of them said, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And while the disciples were amazed at the splendid appearance of Herod's temple, Jesus saw no reason for the temple to exist anymore. Not even one stone upon a stone. And then he announced the destruction of that temple. The presence of one destitute widow questions the reason for the temple's existence. The presence of one destitute widow points to the failure of God's people to be the people who God called them to be. I don't know if today's temple, today's church, is any better. I pray that we are better, always in our striving to serve the poor, the orphan, the alien, and the widow in our midst. We welcome them, but do we help them? Do we help them? Our Lord is pleased when we do, and we are better when we do. Perhaps, dear church, we have not hit rock bottom yet. As the prophets have always said, there is still time to turn, time to listen, time to repent. There is still time to choose a better path. There is still time for us because God has not given up on us. We may still choose to help the orphans, the immigrants, the widows, and the poor among us. We choose this for the sake of Christ and the world that he lives to save. And one way Jesus lives and saves the world is through each one of us, through us who make up his church, the living body of Christ.